four o'clock, which means that we're privileged to now be sharing this platform, such as it is, with the fabulous Dr. Phil Hammond, uh, doctor, broadcaster, TV personality. Who knows what he hasn't done? But Phil, it's fantastic to have you this afternoon. Thank you for giving up some of your time. On behalf of the Academy of Fabulous Stuff, you're a great friend to us and have been for many, many years. Now. So thank you. What are you up to? Uh, well, I'm sitting uh, at my desk. I know how to sit down. I was going to show best practice and uh, give my talk standing up because um, I'm now consulting almost entirely from home uh, these days. I work in uh, the paediatric department at the Royal United Hospital in Bath. Uh, and I volunteered my services for frontline COVID care at the very beginning. And I was told I was too old and useless and I just spoiled the statistics as well as being at high risk of death. Uh, and because we didn't have a huge outbreak in the southwest, I was then confined to home and asked to run the paediatric chronic fatigue service entirely or almost entirely by video consultation. And it's been really interesting, a huge change. So suddenly we've gone from. 90% face-to-face and 10% Skype to probably the reverse. And what's interesting in this time of change is that our um, productivity has gone up 30%. And by that, I mean, when young people have severe fatigue, chronic fatigue syndrome, post-viral fatigue, they often struggle to get to hospital uh, and uh, driving all the way here, feeling car sick, feeling exhausted, finding somewhere to park. Uh, a lot of people don't make their consultations. Compliance has been much better with video consultations. Uh, the young people and the parents really like it. You get a very privileged peek into their home. It's a bit like when I was a GP and I used to do a home visit. So I had one great consultation with somebody up in Liverpool while the entire family was watching the football while I was trying to consult, which reminded me a bit of being a GP. Um, but young people are uh, really enjoying the service. Uh, so in this time of great difficulty, we've actually discovered a way of consulting um, that most people find beneficial. You have to safety net, of course. Uh, and so um, about 10 percent of consultations we still see face to face because you know that chronic fatigue and all the symptoms you can get, headaches, dizziness, nausea, uh, various aches and pains, postural hypotension, et cetera, can be caused by other things, particularly the headaches. So some patients we need to see face to face to examine. Um, but we've managed to increase our productivity by 30 percent despite the pandemic. So we're really pleased with ourselves. I thought I'd reflect a little bit on what the pandemic has meant for me, uh, starting with what I got most wrong. Uh, I've always been one from learning from my mistakes and that the beauty of combining a career uh, as a doctor and a comedian is that you can turn all your mistakes into material on stage. And I made an absolute howler at the beginning of this. I'm a, I trained as a GP. I've worked for a few years in sexual health and I now work in post viral fatigue, but I'm not a virologist. And I made the mistake at the beginning of this in January, thinking that we would contain the virus because the SARS-CoV-2 virus would behave in a very similar way to the SARS-CoV-1 virus. If you don't know much about viruses, you would think that was a pretty reasonable assumption to make. And if you're old enough to remember back in 2003, uh, we didn't have a pandemic because we managed to contain the SARS-CoV-1 virus. Why did we manage to contain it? Well, actually, it's probably more virulent than the 2019-20 version. But the point is just about everybody who had it had symptoms. Uh, so you knew when they were sick and you knew when they were infectious. Uh, and therefore it was much easier to contain as we did some very good global public health work stopped it from becoming a pandemic the 2019-20 one against my better judgment is an absolute bugger to contain because a lot of the spread occurs pre-symptomatically so before people have symptoms and then most people don't have any symptoms at all even when they're spreading it a bit like chlamydia a lot of people assume that if you had a dose of chlamydia or a sexually transmitted infection you definitely have symptoms and that simply isn't the case. So a lot of the spread is happening asymptomatically, which makes it really, really hard to contain. So we could go into a long debate about how good our test, trace, isolate and support system has been. Um, I think we've missed a bit on the contact tracing. I, uh, I use the acronym FETISH. I do like an acronym. And I think <laughs> we need to find, explain, test, trace, isolate, support and home visit. So the issue is every disease we've ever known has disproportionately affected poor people. Just about every disease we know disproportionately affects poor people. So in any pandemic or any disease outbreak, the bottom line is protect the poor. Uh, now, if you're gonna be asking people on minimum wage or uh, on zero hours contracts jobs to isolate for two weeks when they're already struggling to put food on the table, you need to A, give them the support and the financial support that allows them to do that. So probably 
Uh, the most scary statistic that came out of this was research done by UCL that found at the height of the pandemic in May, uh, they found that less than 20% of people were managing to isolate for the full 14 days and about 11%, I think, were managing to quarantine. So even if we really did have a world-class test and trace system, it's only as good as uh, helping people to isolate. And that's the bit of the jigsaw we failed on. But why have we failed? Because this virus, like every other disease, disproportionately affects the poor. Uh, there was a lovely quote that Brian Dolan used earlier that I've been using, that um, uh, we may be in the same storm, but we're on very different boats. So in Northeast Somerset, I've been floating along. We had low levels to start with. We still have low levels. I play outdoor football. I go and see my mates. I go to the pub every Wednesday. I'll be going this evening. Lovely pub, good ventilation. Everybody follows the etiquette. We all check in. There's no overcrowding. I've been there right throughout the pandemic when we've been able to, been able to socialise and see my mates. Uh, I've lost 70% of my work because um, there's no comedy in public speaking anymore, but I'm lucky to be able to survive on the 30% that I have. There are loads of people out there who are worried about money, and when you're worried about money, all other health concerns pale in comparison. So we've had a few heroes coming out of here. Marcus Rashford was one of my heroes. I think, wow, to take time off uh, his football uh, commitments to campaign for free school meals actually hit the nail on the head. Uh, we sort of, in, you know, yes, we need to protect the NHS, but we need to protect the poor more. Uh, and have we been good at doing this? Who knows? Uh, the thing I found hardest, so having made my big howler and thought that we wouldn't have a pandemic because we control it as we did in 2003. Uh, the thing I think I found um, hardest is what I call entrenched certainty. So a bit like the Brexit debate, if you go on social media, people very strongly uh, believe in one way of dealing with this without really embracing the uncertainty and the complexities. There's a hell of a lot we don't know, lots of known unknowns uh, and probably lots of unknown unknowns. Uh, George Davy Smith, who is like the James Dean of epidemiologists, has written a lovely paper about embracing uncertainty. And it starts with a strap line, the more certain somebody is about how to manage COVID, the less you should trust them. Uh, and I think that's probably true. So we get very angry about doing one thing locking down or doing another thing, letting it run free. Actually, what we should be doing is encouraging debate uh, and allowing people to express their opinions. Uh, and that's become very difficult because we know in something like a pandemic, as the evidence accumulates, we may have to change position. Well, if you've taken a deeply entrenched position, being absolutely certain that this is the way to manage it, and then the virus changes or the evidence changes and you have to change direction, it makes it much harder. So I think what we need is a bit of humility to say, look, OK, I made this big mistake or I called this wrong, or I thought this would happen, and it didn't, and recognise that it's okay to change your mind. Politicians can change their mind, epidemiologists can. Uh, so my second favourite quote um, uh, came in the pub early on, um, when, bless him, Chris Whitty, our chief medical officer, he deserves, well, I don't know what he deserves, but he deserves a holiday after this at the very least. And I was sitting in the pub, and this bloke said, you know, I realised that we were in trouble when... Uh, Chris Whitty got it. I thought if the bloke who knows more about the virus and how not to catch it catches the virus, then we're all doomed. And I think that's an interesting point as well. In the absence uh, of a vaccine, um, this virus is going to wax and wane for a while. It could be with us for another year or more. Uh, cheerful Chris uh, has told us that he thinks we're going to manage it better uh, by next year. So by next winter, we'll be managing it better. And that makes the point that it is here for the long run. And we can't keep locking down the whole of society all the time. We need to find more intelligent ways uh, of dealing with this. Um, and uh, my big intervention, I suppose, as well as writing for Private Eye all the way through this. So I've written over 70,000 words every couple of weeks in Private Eye, acknowledging my errors and hoping to continuously improve. Um, I also co-authored or co-wrote a letter uh, to Matt Hancock saying, let's also think about the non-COVID harms. So it is true that you have to manage COVID well to let the NHS cope to allow us to do some of our council work. Uh, but it's also true that locking people down has led to increases in depression, anxiety, domestic abuse, lack of fitness, poor immunity, uh, and obviously losing people's jobs. Without jobs, uh, life is rotten. Uh, so recognising the non-COVID harms and balancing them in. It's very hard to say that a, a life from COVID is worth any more than a life lost to depression because you've locked somebody up. So we need to be a bit more humble, I think, and, and represent both sides of the argument. I've never known anything in my lifetime where we've just talked about a single risk and a single cause of death almost relentlessly on, on the TV. The death figures go up. 
And we don't put it in balance. We don't put deaths from other causes. We don't put whether the overall excess death rate is up or down. We don't balance the risk. We don't talk about years of life lost. It could be, we don't know yet. It could be that because the average age of somebody dying from COVID is 82.4 years, slightly above your average life expectancy, it could be that COVID doesn't have much effect on overall life expectancy. People die at roughly the age we expect them to do. And actually the people who die from cancer and heart disease because they were too scared to get treatment or weren't able to, maybe the ones who die prematurely. So lots of complex stuff that we don't fully understand. So how are you supposed to cope? The first thing I think I'd say is that, think about yourself. We always say this, and there are lots of workshops going on about managing your own health and your well-being. And most people understand what a care service is, but it's interesting that millions of us work in health without quite understanding what health means. Now, the original definition of health from the World Health Organization uh, back in 19, ooh, about the year the NHS was formed, 1948, the World Health Organization gave us the official definition of health, which was not just an absence of disease or disability, but a complete state of physical, mental and uh, social well-being. Uh, now, to be honest, that set a bit of a high bar. For a start, most of us have a bit of disease on us. We all have a bit of dandruff. Uh, we've all been exposed to herpes or a lot of us exposed to HSV in the past. We carry all sorts of viruses and bugs along with us. Uh, we've all got a bit of dental decay and gum disease. So none of us is completely without disease. So on that basis, none of us are healthy. I also don't think there are many people out there in a complete state of physical, mental and social well-being. Uh, a wonderful scientist and skeptic, Petter Strabanek, once said that you only have achieved complete social, mental uh, and physical well-being at orgasm or taking uh, opium, uh, which is clearly not something we can do all the time. So I think we need a new definition of health. If we're going to work in the health service, what does it mean? What does our health mean? What does it mean to be healthy? Uh, and I think there are three strands to health. Uh, I call it a health fad, F-A-D. Uh, the first strand of health is our freedom, our freedom to live a life that we have reason to value that also values other people. It's really important that second bit. You might value driving the wrong way down a motorway with a head full of ecstasy, um, but that would put other people at risk. So our values have to be the same values as other people. And you look at the countries that have managed COVID better, I think they've done it more out of shared values uh, and, and uh, less anger and separation. So Jacinda Ardern or Cindy, as they call her in New Zealand, uh, has sort of united the country around a set of shared values of looking out for each other. And interestingly, even before the pandemic, she had a budget where she put health and well-being of people and planet as our primary political focus. So I think Jacinda Ardern has been way ahead of the curve. I don't think it's as simple as saying we could have copied New Zealand and we'd be in exactly the same place with far fewer cases because New Zealand is about 14 contiguous. Uh, the UK is about 14 contiguous New Zealand's all joined together. We're a massively larger and more complex, uh, more diverse uh, uh, nation than New Zealand. So we would always have struggled to contain it. But you need those shared values. So the first uh, strand of health, your freedom to live a life that you have reason to value that also values others. The second strand of health, uh, I think, is your ability to cope uh, when shit happens, when bad things happen in your life, when difficult things happen. How do you bounce back? In a sense, that's what evolution is. The people who survive are the ones who evolve to respond to change the best. So how are we adapting? What have we learned in this pandemic? Well, to make the point again, the best shield against COVID is wealth. Now, if you live where I live in lovely Somerset, people have wealth. They live in lots, not everyone, but quite a few people have green space around them. They're able to get outdoors. Uh, there are less multi-generational families all crammed in a house together. Um, so your ability um, to, to respond to change is largely determined by wealth and luck. And so when you've sorted yourself out, we need to sort other people out who are less fortunate. So that ability to adapt to change, and that's what we're celebrating, Change Day. We know that things change. We've had all sorts of stuff to deal with in the past. We adapt, we cope, and we improve. Not only are we bouncing back, we've heard some wonderful presentations today where people have bounced forwards. They've come up with new ways of working that have radically improved patient care. And I said earlier, our switch to video consultations has increased our patient throughput by 30% because our DNAs have dropped dramatically. So new ways of working are good, so let's adapt and focus on change. And the last round of health, the D of my health fad, is duty. I think health is also a duty uh, to look after yourself, uh, to look after others, to look after uh, people and planet and other species. That duty of care, which we're very used to, 
uh, are doing in the NHS and social care. What we're less good at is caring for ourselves. So we're brilliant at working 100 hours a week for people that are most in need and then our own health suffers. So how do you do your health fad? How do you have the freedom to live a life you have reason to value, the ability to bounce back when tough stuff happens and the duty to care? Uh, I break that down and people who've heard me speak before will have heard of my clangers. You'll have to imagine what my clanger looks like. It sounds like disgusting, that doesn't it? I hope maybe from the general medical council has tuned in, but this is what my clanger sounds like. <laughs> Uh, as a kid, I was rather enchanted uh, by the Clangers. They were this amazing um, family of pink moon mice. In 1969, they were launched, the year we landed on the moon. Uh, it was also the year my dad died. Uh, I'm half Australian and my dad, Barry, was a brilliant man. He was an academic chemist. He was captain of all Australian universities basketball team. He had the brain the size of a planet. But like many academics, um, he overthought things and got depressed uh, and sadly took his life uh, when I was seven. And my brother was nine. And I remember, I don't know why I became transfixed with the clangers, but there was something about the escapers and the clangers living on this uh, beautiful blue planet, uh, all looking out for each other. Uh, and they would uh, have uh, blue string pudding uh, and uh, soup from the soup dragon. And they do lots of stuff outdoors. They would drop mistakes. They would make mistakes. They would drop their clangers, but they'd all come together at the end with a hug and celebrate a community. So I've been a slight obsession with the clangers over the years. And then when I started working in paediatrics, I was thinking of a way to teach people the fundamentals of health. What are the daily health habits? So if health is still slightly nebulous. If you tell people health is their freedom to live a life, they have reason to value their ability to bounce back and their duty to care. How do you actually do it? Uh, and these pillars of health, the healthy habits, the joys of health, as I call them, are fairly well evidenced now. Uh, and we know rather bizarrely, the things you need to do to be healthy uh, come in the acronym CLANGERS. And they are connect, learn, be active, notice, give back, eat well, relax, sleep. Connect, learn, be active, notice, give back, eat well, relax, sleep. Uh, now, in my rather privileged position in North Somerset, I find it relatively easy uh, to do my daily CLANGERS. Uh, we know, and again, it's been mentioned today, that the isolation living on your own is as bad for you as 15 cigarettes a day. Connecting with the outside world is really important. How do you do that in, in COVID times? Uh, I'm patron of a wonderful charity called Kissing It Better, and they came up with this lovely idea called Singing Outside the Box. Uh, so in good times, they go into care homes and nursing homes, and they take people from local colleges, such as hairdressers and manicurists, uh, and they go uh, into uh, care homes and they go into hospitals and they do people's hair and they do their nails and they sing to them and they recite poetry and cheer them up, and go through picture books. Couldn't do that, uh, obviously, during uh, the pandemic. And people in care homes particularly were terribly isolated. Some of them were saying, look, I want to take a risk. I don't want to be isolated. I want human contact. And Kissing and Better got all these young people to go outside and sing to people outside their rooms, all that singing outside the box. And then they had this great idea of getting people to do their Duke of Edinburgh Awards scheme uh, by uh, teaching people in care homes to use, if they could, to use iPads or to come up with uh, memories uh, that they could send to them and then discuss them online to those who are able to do that. So just because I don't think uh, social isolation, we're personally isolated, but we mustn't be social isolated. So connect, learn. Golly, you've got to learn on our feet with COVID. And this is the repository for all our best learning the fabulous stuff library where all these great ideas we've seen presented today uh, can be picked up by anyone uh, but also remember that humility sometimes we get things wrong sometimes we try stuff we realize it doesn't work you put your hand up and you try something else very hard to do that in politics a bit easier to do that in the health service than it used to be but we're still slightly frightened of making a mistake but look how much better we've got at treating covid not just uh, using dexamethasone but methods of nursing people on intensive care etc have improved the staff are exhausted. You know, whether you argue the NHS was overwhelmed or not, I don't think many people were denied a ventilator, but there were nurses looking after four uh, intensive care patients when normally they try to do one on one care. People absolutely exhausted and on the floor, really worried about how they're going to cope. So we really need to support the staff because some of them will be having time off with stress and breaks. So if we go into a second wave, we may overwhelm the staff, whether we overwhelm the service. It's really important that we recognise that. And I loved the idea earlier, listening to another presentation about wobble rooms, the idea that you have a place to go just to get your head together and just to pamper yourself. Lots of resources to reconnect you with the real world. Um, we have hospital dogs at the RUH in Bath and they have an extraordinary effect. This dog wanders around the boards and intensive care goes all over the place. Uh, I'm pretty certain they, they screen it for COVID. 
Um, but what's interesting is not only the patients reach out and love a dog, it reminds them of normality, they get unconditional love, but it dramatically improves the, the staff well-being as well. So lots of inventive ways to improve staff well-being. Being active is important. Uh, I do most of my consultations standing up. I try and move around a lot. Uh, you've really got to force yourself to get outdoors, get a bit of vitamin D, and then notice the beauty of the world around you. Connect with those beautiful autumn leaves. Just taking five minutes or 10 minutes or maybe 15 minutes to be still. Every day, John thought I'd gone there, but I was just being still for 15 minutes every day and enjoy the beauty of the world around you. Absolutely stunning leaves at the moment as they fall. So don't have your head in the hospital so much that you miss those autumn leaves. Giving back to others we know already is the importance of that. That's the job that we do. It gives us meaning and purpose. My old dad, bless him, one of the few memories I have of my dad was camping out under the stars in the Australian bush and asking him what the meaning of life was. You're a very bright chemist, my dad. He went, Philip, there is no great purpose. There is no grand design. We're all slowly returning to room temperature, uh, which is true. It's the second law of thermodynamics, but it's slightly depressing. We are all returning to room temperature. The wonders of the galaxy themselves have no meaning at all. It's humans that give the world meaning. We decide what the meaning of our life is. I personally think we exist to love and be loved. Uh, and I think the hardest thing about this pandemic is that people haven't been able to hug. The physical contact that usually reinforces love has been very much reduced. And that's had a huge emotional impact on us. Uh, so we've had to restrict our bubbles to our closest loved ones. But giving back to others is important. But we don't, most of us don't have Mother Teresa levels of empathy. We need time off. It's okay to be knackered and exhausted in the end of your tether. But you have to step in and protect your, your health and take some time off and rest and recover. Uh, I've always talked about eating well. We know that it's fine to have the odd donut on the ward and a bit of a treat occasionally. But generally, too much ultra processed food isn't great for you. We have poor metabolic health. And we know there are 15 million people in the UK with a chronic disease. And that puts them not just at higher risk of COVID, but actually far higher risk of premature death from heart disease, stroke, cancer, depression. So actually what we should be doing is using this opportunity lockdown as, as an opportunity to get Britain fit. If we could improve people's metabolic fitness, improve their diet, improve their sleep, um, improve their education, improve their relaxation, et cetera, uh, we could dramatically not only reduce their chance of dying from COVID if they caught it, but dying from just about any other disease. So that seems to be a bit of a missed opportunity, uh, but eat food that's nutritious and delicious. Food should be a joy as well as something that you need and whole foods are best. So have the odd ultra processed treat, but try and stock up on whole foods, as much fruit and veg as you can load in there. Plenty of water. Uh, relax. Uh, really take time to come off your phone, uh, cut back on your caffeine uh, and just take time to relive the day. Think about the good things first and then think about the things you could improve. Uh, I remember a very wise man saying to me once, one of my managers said that work is always limitless and time is limited. So you're never going to do it all. And so many uh, health and care staff push themselves to the point of exhaustion because there's always more that you could do, but there's no point in doing so much that it affects your health and makes you unable to function. So you've got to have a time where you say, stuff it. I've done as much as I can for now. Uh, you don't leave it behind completely. You may still think about it, but you've got to recognize that sometimes good enough is OK. We have a National Institute for Clinical Excellence. But I argued a while ago we should also have NIGE, the National Institute for Good Enough. Because sometimes in life, you can't be clinically excellent. Sometimes in life, good enough is OK. And that's sort of the difference between safety and quality. If we can't always deliver the highest quality care, we've always got to make sure that our, our care is as safe as it can be. Uh, uh, but it won't always be brilliant. And we have to accept that. So relax, wind down. Uh, I find pets are great. Uh, dogs give you unconditional love. You hug them. It reduces your blood pressure. And they also reduce your cholesterol uh, by eating your food. They're always happy to see you and they're generally moist at both ends and just lovely. I love my dogs. So um, yours could be a cat, could be a pot plant, have something else outside, completely takes you away from your work that allows you to relax. And then sleep. Sleep is the forgotten medicine. Golly, working on shift system mucks up your sleep. But we know that if you can manage to get refreshing sleep every night, it dramatically improves your mood, uh, your performance, uh, your thought processes, your stamina. Usain Bolt before he broke the world sprinting record, uh, he used to have a nap. Uh, he found that sleep right up to the minute of breaking the Olympic record was really important. 
Uh, when you're working shift systems, your sleep is disordered because of your work pattern. You need nap rooms and the wisest hospitals have chairs or rooms. Uh, we talked about the wobble room where you can get a bit of kip or just lie down and relax. Really important to, to ease off on the caffeine after midday. Alcohol actually also really disrupts your sleep. So uh, if you are going to drink, please do so in the morning. Uh, I made that up. Oh, that was a joke, by the way, in case anyone's saying I'm going to refer him to the General Medical Council. But we do know too much alcohol. You think, oh, no, I'll have a couple of red wines and a Puriton. That'll help me sleep. It doesn't dramatically. You don't get the right sort of sleep. So there are two types of sleep. One is gathering the clay for your sculpture and one is performing the sculpture and sculpturing these wonderful dreams. And you need to do both phases. Drugs are for the short term and alcohol and caffeine certainly don't help. And you'll find if you really do try and ease off on the caffeine a bit after midday and allow yourself to get that eight hour sleep or six hour sleep or whatever, it dramatically improves your mood when you wake up in the morning. Open up the curtains, let the blue light in, that cuts down the melatonin, boosts the cortisol, get outside, get your vitamin D. In fact, probably take your vitamin D tablets uh, during uh, the winter because we don't get enough of them and you're all stuck indoors. Um, and I think of health a little bit like the Olympic cycling team when they were asked, in London, how they won so many gold medals, did they have a super bike? And they said, no, we made lots of incremental improvements in lots of little areas, the pedals and the lycra and the tyres and the track. It's like that with your health and it's like that with our patients and our clients' health, is that often there aren't great big solutions that suddenly come along. We make these little incremental improvements. And I think if you focus on that, having realistic expectations, accepting that sometimes uh, your best is good enough, it doesn't have to be clinical excellent, but what can you do to incrementally improve? Then out of this will come a fair amount of post-traumatic growth. We can throw our hands up in despair. We can say, if you look at the league table for both COVID deaths and harms and non-COVID deaths and harms, uh, the UK was pretty much the lowest in Europe or certainly down the bottom of the table. And we can have arguments and we can debate and we can blame. Uh, from my personal point of view, I think um, we need to fund health and care services a bit better. You know, if we've had 10 years of austerity where they're already overloaded and we have huge staff shortages and huge waiting lists before the pandemic, you're not going to have the spare capacity um, to, to uh, be able to serve the most disadvantaged, certainly during a pandemic. We know we an extraordinary achievement of building all these Nightingale hospitals, but we couldn't use them as much as we wanted to because we don't have the staff. We know this and somebody has to have an honest conversation about what we spend our money on because we wait until a big trauma happens and then we spend a fortune trying to sort that trauma out. We're, we spend around 200 billion at the moment in lost revenue and spending on the pandemic. But actually, if we'd spent a fraction of that money with better preparation and planning, got a test, trace, isolate, support, fetish system up and running sooner uh, and had a bit more spare capacity um, in our health and social care services, put have paid a bit more tax, as they do, for example, in Sweden, I think we'd have coped with it better. But we can't get away from the fact that we've been near the bottom of the table, which means we're probably in wave two, not suddenly going to be at the top of the table. Um, we're going to make incremental improvements with realistic expectations. Um, but we need to get everyone on board. You know, we need to get uh, uh, people to start trusting each other. And we also need to rediscover our sense of humour. What the British are very good at, are laughing in adversity. I think the thing we've really mucked up on this is that we haven't used comedians nearly enough. Um, in Taiwan, they used comedians to, to, to uh, dispel ridiculous rumours about the coronavirus. They call it humour, not rumour. Comedians are actually better than politicians and management consultants at connecting with an audience and um, putting people at ease and making them laugh. And they haven't got any gigs at the moment. So it would have been wonderful to get all our comedians in to, to cheer up the nation and improve their health generally. So not, don't focus on COVID relentlessly, focus on health. Do a clangers for all campaign. Go into schools, teach people about their clangers because we can teach people about avoiding the virus. But if they do get the virus, if you do your daily clangers, you're less likely to be harmed by it. Uh, and finally, the, the way generally we communicate risk, I think, is important. Uh, we're always taught as doctors to use bran. Uh, in, the, in the old days, doctors just told you what you were doing, a bit like the government at the moment. They didn't give you any choice. Um, uh, but then we moved to this idea of shared decision making. And we talk about bran in shared decision making. If you had got any complex decision, you sit somebody down and honestly, you say, look, here are the various options. Here are the benefits and risks. Here are the alternatives, here are the uncertainties, and here's what's like to happen if we did nothing. And you share that with people rather than saying, this is definitely what's happening. This is what we definitely have to do. You say, oh, hang on, there's a bit of uncertainty here. 
we don't definitely know. This is a new virus. It could behave in all sorts of ways that we hadn't quite anticipated. This is what we think is right at the moment, but we may have to change position. Uh, and I think we haven't quite cracked that. The big unknown for me, the thing that really uh, got me thinking in all this is death. 20, golly, what is it? 28,000 more deaths than expected have happened at home. 25,000 of them not linked to COVID. It could be many of them were COVID deaths, but were never diagnosed as such because we weren't testing. It could be that people were too frightened to leave home and they died at a young age from heart disease or cancer at home and they might have been saved. But it could also be that some people were choosing to have decent deaths at home, or I hope they had decent deaths at home because they didn't want to go into hospital or care home and be isolated from their loved ones. So the public may have taught us a lesson here. We won't know until we do research to find out why so many of these deaths have occurred at home. Uh, did some of them happen in, in desperate situations or, or some of them, were they decent deaths? Were a bit like the old days when those bookends of life, birth and death happened in, in, in the home. Uh, and maybe that's something that we can learn about death from all this, because it's not so much about when you die. Uh, it's also how you die. And perhaps one of the biggest reactions for this may be, you know, the, the prolonged grief from people who weren't able to be with their loved ones at the end and the staff who had to separate them. That must be very traumatic. But there may also be some stories of hope where people stayed at home and had decent deaths at home. So lots of stuff we still don't know, but thank you uh, for listening and thank you for all you do in Change Day. I'm always amazed by the breadth and enthusiasm, even in difficult times, uh, that you share. Uh, I'm not quite as old as Roy, uh, Lily, but I'm 58. Uh, I'm the average age of somebody on intensive care with COVID, so I'm taking it seriously. I follow all the rules. I really don't want to get it. But actually, at 58, I'm more at risk of heart disease, of cancer, of a stroke and of depression. So I manage those risks, too. So let's not become one risk ponies. Let's not become obsessed with a single issue when there are lots of other issues. We spend all our lives balancing risks. Uh, so do that. Go out, do your clangers, try and have five portions of fun a day. And remember that laughter is the best medicine, uh, unless you have syphilis, in which case it's penicillin. Thank you for listening. I've been Dr. Phil. I'm going to hand you back to lovely John now, if he's still there. Are you still there, John? Oh, Phil. Well, look, I, I just decided very early on in that, that I would just let you speak. And I'm so glad I did, because I just think that was box office. We've got loads of people who are commenting on our, on our private Fab Change Day uh, WhatsApp feed, how much they're, en they're enjoying it. We've got some people in tears who are very moved by what you've said. You know, I, I've, I must send you our, our utmost debt of gratitude. It was absolutely sensational. The th One last thing, thing, last thing I'd like to share, John, it's a lovely Probably. quote. My old GP trainer was a bloke called Brian, and he was a Yorkshireman, and he was just wonderful, old style GP. And he used to go, "Do you know what the most powerful drug in the world is? It's kindness. Works for works for everyone. Very hard to get the dose wrong, and it's free at the point of delivery. Uh, and it's a, a really important point. Kindness is the best medicine. If nothing else, be kind. If you can be intelligent and kind at the same time, that's even better. That's a, that's a very good. That's a very good point. Uh, that's a very good point. Uh, Phil, on which to end. Uh, thank you. Um, uh, can you hear me, Phil? I just hope you can. I can hear you perfectly. So I can't. So you're looking really well, Roy. Well, how do you stay in such good shape? Well, I, I, I'm just built for lockdown, Phil. You know, I, I, the, Lily is, is the lockdown layabout. <laughs> you know, what, what skin products? Are you, what skin products are you using, Roy? I, yeah, well, this is my number five, darling. Um, <laughs> It, and that's pan stick number five, which you will know is like about the thickest you can get. Listen, Phil, that was terrific. I'm so I'm sorry I wasn't here at the uh, the start. I was just wrapping up with our uh, presentation from um, from New York. Uh, it, you, you've been a real star to help us today. Thank you very much, and you've ended uh, our conference on a on a really great note. If 